investments that will serve our economy for years to come. We intend to double our capacity to gen uh, generate renewable energy while redoubling our efforts to use energy more efficiently. We will rebuild Roman roads, retrofit aging transit systems, and renovate 10,000 schools for our children. We will bring health care into the 21st century by computerizing medical records, counting, uh, saving countless lives and billions of dollars. I'm pleased that the House has acted with the urgency necessary in passing this plan. I hope we can strengthen it further in the Senate. What we can do is drag our feet or delay much longer. The American people expect us to act. And that's exactly what I intend to do as President of the United States. But passing my plan is not the end. It's just the beginning of what we have to do. We know we need to create jobs, but not just any jobs. We need to create jobs that sustain families and sustain dreams. Jobs in new and growing industries. Jobs that don't feel like a dead end, but a way forward and a way up. Jobs that will foster a vibrant and growing middle class. Because the strength of our economy can be measured directly by the strength of our middle class. And that's why I've created the Task Force on Middle Class Working Families. And why I've asked my Vice President, Joe Biden, to lead. There's no one who brings to bear the same combination of personal experience and substantive expertise. Joe's come a long way and has achieved a great deal, but he's never forgotten his roots as a working class kid from Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's lived the American dream and lived and worked to make that dream a reality for others. This task force will bring together my economic advisors and members of my cabinet to focus on policies that will really benefit the middle class. Policies to create jobs that pay well and provide a chance to save. To create jobs in growing fields and train workers to fill them. To ensure that workplaces are safe and fair, as well as flexible for employees juggling the demands of work and family. I think I should note that when I talk about the middle class, I'm talking about folks who are currently on the middle class, but also people who aspire to be in the middle class. We're not forgetting the poor. They are going to be front and center because they too share our American dream. And we're going to make sure that they can get a piece of that American dream if they're willing to work for it. I also believe that we have to reverse many of the policies towards organized labor that we've seen these last eight years, policies with which I've sharply disagreed. I do not view the labor movement as part of the problem. To me, it's part of the solution. We need we need to level the playing field for workers and the unions that represent their interests. Because we know that you cannot have a strong middle class without a strong labor movement. We know that strong, vibrant, growing unions can exist side by side with strong, vibrant, and growing businesses. This isn't an either-or proposition between the interests of workers and the interests of shareholders. That's the old argument. The new argument is that the American economy is not and has never been a zero-sum game. When workers are prospering, they buy products that make businesses prosper. We can be competitive and lean and mean and still create a situation where workers are thriving in this country. So I'm going to be signing three executive orders designed to ensure that federal contracts serve taxpayers efficiently and effectively. One of these orders is going to prevent taxpayer dollars from going to reimburse federal contractors to spend money trying to influence the formation of unions. We will also require that federal contractors inform their employees of their rights under the National Labor Relations Act. Federal labor laws encourage collective bargaining and employees should know their rights to avoid disruption of federal contracts. And I'm issuing an order so that qualified employees will be able to keep their jobs even when a contract changes hands. We shouldn't deprive the government of these workers who have so much experience in making government work. We need to keep our energy focused and our eyes fixed on the real measure of our prosperity. The success of folks that Joe and I have met across this country who are working hard each and every day. 
I'm eager to see this task force in action. I'm eager to discuss its findings with Joe Biden and working with the people in this room. I intend to get this economy on track to create the jobs of the future and make sure that the American people can achieve their dreams, not just for themselves, but for their children. So with that, let me introduce uh, our chair of our middle class task force, my vice president, and the pride of uh, Delaware, <laughs> Joe Biden. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President, for that generous introduction. <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you here today. Uh, we, uh, as we announced this, uh, this task force uh, on our uh, on the middle class. Folks, uh, um, I want to thank the outstanding individuals, many of whom are in this room, members of Congress, members of labor, members of business, uh, interest groups that are here representing nonprofits. I, I, I want to thank you all for, uh, for being here today. It's good to see so many uh, of my friends who organize, our friends who organize labor as well. Welcome back to the White House. I, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that all of us in this room know is uh, those very leaders, Mr. President, of organized labor dedicated their lives to the thing that this task force is about, uh, making the lives of uh, working people better. I would argue there would be no middle class if not an organized labor movement that started uh, 150 years ago. And I'm proud that this administration of your leadership, Mr. President, to be alive in that effort. And I want to thank you for uh, convening and, uh, and empowering this task force, Mr. President. In doing so, I think you send a very, very clear signal to everyone in this country who goes to work every day without expecting a claim or big bonuses uh, the people that uh, President Teddy Roosevelt referred to as the doers of deeds, uh, the men and women who teach our children, who uh, protect our neighborhoods, who build our homes, who staff our hospitals, who work on the line, all those people. To this, uh, the great American middle class, you have simply said, uh, uh, we're on your side. And uh, it's just basic, it's that basic from my perspective. And so for too many years, uh, we've had a White House that has failed to put the American middle class at the front and center of our economic policies. And even when our economy, even when our economy was growing, uh, there was a, uh, and it was very solid ground in which to build. The middle class uh, found itself slipping. Productivity went up almost 20% uh, between 2000 and 2007, yet income for working families fell by $2,000 a year. And now with our economy struggling, the pain is significantly worse. Trillions of dollars in home equity, retirement savings, college savings, gone. And every day, more and more Americans are losing their jobs. And for many people, the work of a lifetime has literally disappeared. It's cruel, but it's also it's threatening to sap the spirit of the country. Mr. President, you said it best in your inaugural address, in my view. You said that, quote, a nation cannot prosper long when it favors only the prosperous. Quite simply, a strong middle class, in our view, equals a strong America. Clearly, our most urgent task is to stabilize the economy, which the President is well on his way to putting in place the building blocks to do that, and to put us on the path to recovery. But on top of this urgent task, though, we have an important long-term task as well. We need to make sure that the benefits of a strengthening economy, which we're looking forward to, reach the people responsible for generating that strength. That's why President Obama has asked me to lead this task force, to bring together those cabinet uh, members uh, who have the greatest impact on the well-being and the middle class in our country, as well as seek the opinion and ideas of others in society as to how we can best accomplish these notions. We'll be looking at everything from access to college and Department of Education to business development and Department of Commerce to child care and elder care with health and human resources, excuse me, health and human services to restoring the balance of the workplace uh, with the Department of Labor and restoring labor's place with the Department of Labor. And so this task force, I think, reflects a critical insight by President Obama that uh, we have to bring together the knowledge, the talent, and the skill the people across the whole range of government to best tackle these problems. And as I said, 
and invite the private sector to offer the best ideas available to help us do that. With this task force, we have a single, highly visible group with one single goal, to raise the living standards of the people who are the backbone of this country, the middle class, because when they, in fact, their standards raised, the poor do better. Every, and by the way, the wealthy do better as well. Everyone does better. So today, with the signing of the President's executive orders, which he's about to sign, uh, we begin the work of the task force. And I want to announce that our executive director will be Dr. Jared Bernstein, a man uh, who uh, has dedicated a substantial portion of his uh, professional career and his writing and studying to uh, the economic issues that most impact on the lives of middle class families. We're also launching a website today. The website will be a strong middle class dot gov. Now this website won't just be a source of information. Hopefully it'll be a place for conversation as well. We invite Americans to interact with us and the ideas that they have. We, it will be a place where people can find out not only what we're doing, uh, but also share their ideas and experiences with us. We'll also be listening to people's stories uh, as we hold meetings all across the country in the, and during the life of this task force as we prepare a final report. And our first task force meeting will be held in, on February 27th in Philadelphia. The focus of that meeting will be green jobs. Those jobs that pay well, can't be outsourced, will help us move toward a cleaner, more self-sufficient energy future. Each month to follow, we will focus on a different concern in a different part of the country. How to make retirement more secure, child and elder care, how to make it affordable, improving workplace safety, getting the cost of college within reach of the vast majority of the American people, help weary parents, juggle family and work and create jobs for the future at the end of the day it will be our responsibility to offer the president and to the nation clear and specific steps that we need to take to meet these and other concerns this task force i might add which coming out of the vice president's office will be a bit unique will be fully transparent totally transparent we are going to consult we are going to consult <laughs> we are going to consult Openly, openly in public, with outside groups who can help us develop the most far-reaching and imaginative solutions to help us solve these problems and create the outcome we're looking for. And we'll put all the material from our meetings and any report we produce up on the website. None of this will happen behind closed doors. We want the American people engaged. We want them engaged in the outside. There are some people who say, uh, uh, that are somewhat uh, uh, down on, uh, on the future economic prosperities, uh, prospects in the country, who say that uh, we've entered an age when only a few people can prosper and everyone else has to fall behind. We do not accept that proposition. There has never been, and that has never, ever been part of America's story at any part in our history. And the President and I are determined that it will not be any part of America's story today. The American story is one of expanding opportunity and shared prosperity. It's a story about the future. It's never about the past. It's a story in which we put the middle class families that are the heart of the nation at the heart of our efforts because it drives everything else. Where I grew up as the president of reference, not only in Scranton, but in Wilmington, Delaware, like many, many of you, uh, there were an awful lot of proud women and men who still reside in those neighborhoods. They don't want the government to solve the problem. At the minimum, they wanted the government to understand their problem, to understand their problem, be cognizant of their problem. They just wanted leaders who not only understood their problem, but leaders who would offer them policies that gave them nothing more than a chance, nothing more than a chance to make it. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. I'm not a, you all know that. That's all they want is a chance. They wanted leaders like you, Mr. President. They wanted leaders like those who are gathered here in this room. And they have wanted and want today a White House who's ready to say that the measure of our success will be whether the middle class once again shares in the economic success and prosperity of the nation. And so, Mr. President, uh, I thank you for giving me this responsibility. I look forward to working with the folks in this room and many others 
And I also look forward, Mr. President, to you signing the new elected orders for the first time.